Uh, hello and welcome and thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm very excited to be hosting Professor Tariq Ramadan at the Union today. Um, this time last year, Professor Ramadan visited the Union to participate in a, de in a debate I'd worked on, on the Arab Spring, and it was, it was a very exciting debate, and we're delighted to be welcoming him back. Through his writings and lectures, Professor Ramadan has made an extremely important contribution to the, de to the debate on the issues of Muslims in the West and Islamic revival in the Muslim world. Today he will be speaking on the topic towards a shared contemporary applied ethics and Islamic perspective in relation to his recent work with the Center for Islamic Legislation and Ethics. There are brochures around, so have a look, um, and you can take them. Feel free to take them with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, okay. Thank you for your invitation uh, this evening and uh, for your uh, continuous uh, relationship and invitation here at the Oxford Union. Um, as it was said, uh, in fact, uh, it's the good time for us here to talk about. Uh, ethics and shared ethics, as we have exactly these days, starting today, uh, a seminar on arts and ethics from an Islamic perspective. Uh, and we started, it's connected to what we are doing with the center, and you have this brochure, uh, and we can see here that we are trying to work on, on uh, uh, ethics in 10 fields. In fact, 11, one has to do with the, the scriptural sources and the methodology and, and 10 others have to do with the way we deal with uh, medicine, environment, economics, um, psychology, uh, education, food, today it's arts, uh, politics, and all the, the, the fields are here. And in fact, what we are trying to promote, as we have a satellite office here in Oxford and working in, in uh, Qatar, is really to come with a new methodology with what we call scholars of the text, the people who are religious people dealing with, all religious people, I mean people who are specialized in dealing with the scriptural sources, and on the other side, uh, uh, specialists and scholars who are dealing with as medical doctors and people who are dealing uh, with psychology, media, uh, uh, artists, and trying to put them together and to come with a vision of which type of ethical uh, uh, ground we can get in the specific fields and not having only scholars coming to look at the reality and trying to uh, provide us with a framework uh, which is always adapting to the world and not coming with ethics that is changing the world for the better. And when we talk today about towards a shared, uh, 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 shared ethics and ethical values, this is exactly my point. So my introduction today is really this one. When it comes to ethics and when it comes to uh, dealing with values, the starting point of the discussion for me is not to try to wait to protect ourselves from the world and from the way the state of affairs around us. But it's a very deep and shared understanding that what the world needs today is human beings that are ready to change it in the name of their values. So it's very much about not accepting and trying to protect, but asserting and trying to change. And uh, uh, you will understand what I mean by this uh, 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 during my, my talk, and then hopefully we'll have questions and answers at the end. So let me start with something which is important when it comes to ethics, is to try to, to, to uh, agree or disagree on the definition. What do we mean by ethics? And, and very often uh, there are two types of disagreement. The first, it's the starting point of the agreement if we agree on saying ethics has to do with what is right and what is wrong or what is good and what is bad depending on the way you are dealing with the norms or dealing with the legal framework. But this is where you are trying to uh, give at least a reference for the people uh, to be able to say what is right and what is wrong. Now. Uh, the, dis the, the, the disagreement that we have is on the sources. From where come our va ethical values? And if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the terms, we have in the philosophical Western tradition a very deep discussion about this. What do we mean and what is, for example, the difference between ethics and morality? 
Morality is also about saying what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, and ethics is this. You have some philosophers in the Western tradition saying, in fact, this is exactly the same thing, morality is in Latin what ethics is in Greek. It's a linguistic difference. But you have others saying, no, it's deeper than that. In fact, if you come to the very understanding, and you have this in uh, uh, um, the, the Western tradition, and I will refer to some of the philosophers saying, in fact, when we speak about morality, what we mean is anything which has to do with what is good and what is bad coming from a scriptural reference or uh, a sacred reference or from religions or from spirit spirituality. In fact, when we speak about morality is a top-down uh, approach is given by a religious reference or by a specific spirituality. So we call it morality. So this is why we very often speak about the religious morality, so uh, a, a moral viewpoint. While when it comes to ethics, it's mainly a bottom-up approach which has to do with common rationality. And you have this in the Western tradition, Paul Ricoeur, the French uh, philosopher coming from the Protestant tradition, is saying if you come back to, and he's right on this, if you come back to the great philosophers, you have, for example, Emmanuel Kant speaking about uh, uh, the autonomy of morality. It's, uh, uh, it has to do with rationality. In fact, coming back to Aristotle and before him, of course, Socrates and Plato, what we have here is this understanding that rationality and our common rationality can produce something which has to do with common ethics. So the source is our common rationality. It's not the sacred, it's not a revelation, it's not a religious uh, 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 framework, and this is where we may have a difference. Some, for example, like Weber, in what he was writing when he was talking about Protestant ethics, would disagree with this by saying, no, it's uh, even more complex than this because ethics is both. It could be coming from the scriptural sources and a specific religion, and at the same time, the common rationality. It's not mutually exclusive. You can't just take from this and take from that. It's you can have both. So sometimes what is said in the, the scriptural sources it's the starting point of the framework, and then you add to it the rationality, but still in the Western tradition, this is the perception. And very often now, we stop talking about morality and we, stop, we, we talk about ethics in the way it's implemented from uh, 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 rationality and common rationality. Now, uh, it's a very important question, why? Because uh, downstream from this question you have what is the source? Are we naturally moral human beings and do we have a natural way of looking at ethics? So is morality, if our sense of what is good and what is bad, uh, natural? Is this something that we have uh, as human being and, or is this something that is socially constructed and culturally constructed? Uh, and with this you have the point where you have to come with a discussion about faith and revelation faith and reason, from where uh, do you construct your own way of dealing with reality and saying this is good and this is bad? Is this coming from first uh, a religion? Is it coming from a common rationality? Is it coming from your culture? Is it coming from your education? What is the source of what you call ethics in your life? And this is an important question, especially when we are dealing with pluralistic society. You are now dealing with uh, common uh, fellow citizens, they are coming from everywhere. So you have the legal, the legal framework which is binding us together. And we say, as a citizen or as a, a, a resident in this country, I abide by the law of the country, but that's not enough. You have to add to this something which has to do with norms and values. All the discussion about just after 7-7 in this country, what is Britishness? Was not do you abide by the law or not, is are you sharing our norms as to being able or we can consider you as British, as people who, are, who belong to the country? 
and this has nothing to do with the legal framework. You can have the British passport and don't uh, and you don't look like a British, not only because of your face, but because of what is thought about your values and your norms. So it has to do with the pluralistic society, it has to do with uh, belonging, it has to do with uh, a very deep discussion about what is your frame of reference and what is the source of your frame of reference and how do you deal with your value and is your ethical uh, uh, references here. So the first discussion has to do with faith and rationality. And in fact, behind this, there is a very big discussion about religious reference and secular reference. And if you come back to one of the great philosophers who was denying the existence of God and saying, still, you remember what Dostoevsky said. Dostoevsky said, if there is no God, so everything is possible. Why are we going to, why should I stop lying if there is no God? Everything is possible. Heidegger and then Jean-Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, and Heidegger before him in the existentialist tradition are saying, in fact, it might be, uh, he, he, they are starting with this by saying, yes, that's true. If there is no God, everything is possible. And yet, based on our common rationality, we should produce and we can produce an ethical reference, a moral reference, the secular morality, our secular ethics. And this is something which is based on what is by saying to the people who are relying on faith, we respond that we are relying on rationality. And rationality is not less moral than your way you deal with your reference. What is strong with us is that it's universal by definition because we deal with common rationality and human rationality. In fact, the only way to be universal is to rely on what is common to humanity. Universality among human beings is to rely on a human reference and the only common human reference is our faculty and it's our intellect, so it's rationality. Responding to the claim coming from religions that what they are providing is universal by definition because the religious references are always perceived at, by the believers in the Christian tradition, the Jewish tradition and the Muslim tradition and even in Buddhist and Hindu uh, tradition as universal by definition because this is what you believe. So these are two ways of thinking about, uh, about universality. And it's important in one of the books that I, I wrote called uh, The Quest for Meaning, there is one chapter allocated to this because it's critical. If you want to live together, sometimes in, when we speak about the shared ethical values, you have to start by saying, what is universal in your mind? So what in what you think is beyond what you think to put me where in what you think, if you think that what you think is universal. You got that? Essential. Essential what? Because you remember Jean-Jacques Rousseau who said about the private property, he said the first one who came with sticks and said this is my land and took this from the people, he was a liar. Because he took this property and saying this, I am the owner of this. We do exactly the same. As it was done with private property, we do the same with values. We just put sticks and he said these are universal values. And if you abide by them, you are within my way of dealing with universal, uh, universality. And this is where we should ask ourselves what is shared in what we claim is universal, what is shared by people, and from where we look at the whole question. Now, the second thing which is also important here is a very important uh, uh, discussion today is about what is natural and what is spiritual. Coming from the religious tradition and the spiritual tradition, put them all together, from the Chinese tradition of Confucianism to Hinduism to Buddhism to then Judaism, Christianity and Islam. If you deal with this, is everything in all the religious tradition and the spiritual tradition has to do with spirituality. And what is spirituality is to take into account what is natural and to think that what is natural should be transformed in what has to be human, uh, uh, driven by a set of religious or spiritual uh, uh, um, beliefs. And this is important, is how do you deal with the natural? Not all the religions and not all the spiritualities are dealing with na the natural side of human being the same way. Some are saying there are things in your nature that you have to remove. Others would say there are things in your nature that you have to transform. And 
the, the, some tradition would say there are things in your nature that not only to have to, you have to go to, 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 to transform, but you have to go beyond in order to go a step beyond what is the very definition of uh, your human situation. If you listen to what is said and you study what is said by Buddhism, you should see, and this is something which is important, to be a human being and to live is to suffer. And suffering is, uh, the samsara is you will come back again and again. In fact, you have to free yourself from your own ego to, in order to go beyond suffering. And when you go beyond suffering, you won't come back. So, uh, uh, contrary to what we think sometimes, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, the uh, coming back in the Buddhist tradition is not good news, is a bad one, because you should start suffering again. So, the way we deal with your nature as human being, in, ha in what has to do with ethics, is quite important. In which way you think about your values and in which way you have to transform or to reform or to go beyond your human nature to be more ethical and second spiritual. So the relationship between what is spiritual and what is natural is essential in anything which has to do with ethics. So I don't want to come to the discussion at the end by saying we have shared values, let us go together and everything is fine. This is simplistic simplistic and this is wrong. I would say we should start with the concept of human being, face and uh, reason. How do you deal with uh, everything which has to do with re uh, revelation and rationality? We need to talk about your concept of human beings if you want to come at the end to some shared universal values. But just to go to some universals and you say we agree on justice, we agree on dignity, I think we don't, we don't, we will not get the right answer because we are simplistic as to the responses and not sophisticated as to the starting point of our discussion in philosophical terms, religious terms and spiritual terms. And it's very often missing, even in interface dialogue, even in, in, in a pluralistic society, we abide by the same law, but we don't come to the deep discussion at the center of our respective traditions. And the center is, tell me what you think. Tell me your concept of human being. Tell me what you think about freedom. Tell me what you think about dignity. Tell me what you think about the dignity of the others in your way to deal with yourself, which is essential. What you say about the others will let me know if we might have even an understanding of the shared values and the shared common values the shared uh, universal value, sorry. So this is something which is the starting point of the discussion. If it's now you think that what I'm saying is very complex, this was exactly what I wanted. Okay, it should be understood as a very complex discussion here. Uh, and complex means that in order to get the shared uh, 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 ethical uh, framework or uh, shared universal values, it's very much a starting uh, point of dealing with our own self, with our own tradition, to uh, assess what in our respective tradition is open to the other traditions. How do we talk about the other traditions? And then how do we construct, how do we build this framework and this uh, 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 system of uh, values on which we rely from where we are in our religious tradition or within our society. Now, if I come to uh, and I start uh, uh, with something which is essential, we should not pretend when we speak about shared values that we are in the middle and we welcome everyone. In fact, no one is doing this. Once again, to put you know, the sticks and to say, I am at the universal place, so come to me because this is where universality is, is something which is arrogant and uh, this was the mindset of the colonizers. They have this mission to civilize the world because they thought that they, ha they, they, they got it already, so they have to civilize the people. In, uh, so the mindset of the colonizers is the truth in, is on our side and we have the mission to civilize the people. In fact, if we want to enter into the discussion, we all have to acknowledge the fact. And I, I took the, 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 the image of the mountain in, in, the, in the, the book, uh, The Quest for Meaning, by saying 
in fact, is like a mountain and we are all on our way towards the summit, towards the top. The universal shared values are at the top, but we should all acknowledge that we are taking a specific route to get there. The specific route, the specific path is to look at the mountain from the valley. This is to be a human being. But to look at the mountain from the top, this is God's vision. An arrogance among human beings is to come to the top and to say, this is where I am, so come to me and I have, and I, I am the owner of the top. The only owner of the top, if you believe in God, is God. If you believe in your philosophy, is, okay, this is the ultimate goal of my life. We have paths going there. And from where I am, I'm coming as, uh, 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 from the Islamic uh, perspective. So it's quite important when I start discussing shared values, say from where I am talking about it, not in, or in order not to pretend that I'm, you know, I, don't, I don't belong to a specific tradition. No, the only way for us to come together on a shared uh, vision is tell me from where you look at it. A shared vision is to get View, uh, point of views, view, uh, uh, viewpoints that are helping us to understand from where we are talking. And from where I am, uh, and what I think we have to promote is very much this uh, 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 Christian, Jewish, uh, uh, Buddhist, Hindu, even uh, uh, secular, even atheist, even agnostic traditions that are and should come and say, from where are you talking about the issue? So tell us your concept of human being, how do you deal with this? And in the Islamic tradition, if we have to talk about this, to start from where I am, to come to what I hope would be uh, the shared universal values that we can find in our society, is that we have a problem within the Islamic tradition, uh, the discussion about the source of the Islamic ethics, for example. Uh, we have two schools. One is saying mainly what is uh, the, uh, the framework is all coming from the scriptural sources. So it's mainly when you read the text that you can get the values from an Islamic perspective. And you have another tradition, and this is where sometimes, even in the West, you can get here in this university a PhD in uh, uh, philosophy and not knowing anything about Islamic philosophy in the West and even in Europe. You may, not, you may know only one name which is the one that you quote every time just to show that you don't know anything about the others, uh, which is Averroes. Averroes, Ibn Rushd, is the one who is known because he is the rational mind, not knowing at the same time Ibn Rushd was himself a Muslim judge. He was very versed in anything which has to do with the Islamic legal tradition, but he's not the only one. Uh, they have many, many scholars, and for example, I keep on repeating that Abu Hamid al-Ghazali was the one who came with the rational uh, framework that influenced Descartes, René Descartes, in the 17th century, and he spoke about uh, the relationship between rationality and truth in the 12th century in a very important book in Monqas, Min uh, dalal Deliverance from Error. So what I want to say here is that in the Islamic tradition, we also had this discussion about what is the source of Islamic ethics, or the, the, the understanding of what is good and what is right. And uh, uh, mainly you have two traditions, one saying it's all coming from the scriptural sources, Others are saying no, rationality could be the source, and the Mu'tazila, which is an Islamic trend, saying mainly it's rational. Others saying mainly al ashariya mainly, mainly it's coming from the scriptural source. And in between, al maturidiya uh, it's saying no, we have both. It's two sources that we can use, and we have this. Uh, saying something which is very important. Uh, when you say it's rationality that is producing ethics, you say that uh, our common rationality means that you may find ethical values that are coming as Islamic from a non-Muslim mind, which is essential. Essential mean uh, in the way that uh, Islamic is not only about the source, it's about the objective. When you say some, something like this is very important, is what is your objective? If your objective is good, if you are not Muslim, it's Islamic still because the objective is, is goodness and not the fact that you are Muslim producing it. So it means here, and we have a tradition saying this, Muslim, wisdom is the last property of the Muslim, wherever she or he finds it, 
he should take it. Meaning that all this tradition saying is rational, which was said by Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, uh, uh, that my mind is an inner revelation, an inward revelation. In fact, my mind is producing uh, uh, rules and values that could be right, and when they are right, of course, I have the lights coming from. And by the way, you know, enlightenment and all these things about light as being a reference is also coming from the Arab and Muslim tradition because the Quran is known as light and our mind is known as light as well. So, and our heart is known as light. So, you have a verse in the Quran saying light upon light, meaning the light of revelation coming to the light of your mind and the light, uh, the light of your heart, depending on the Sufi, the mystical tradition or the rational tradition. So, everything that we had in the 18th century dealing with light is something which is very, very close to what the Muslim tradition uh, 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 spoke about for, for, for centuries, but is completely neglected in our common reference as Europeans. Having said that, <coughs> what we have here is this understanding that uh, uh, in the uh, 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 Islamic philosophical tradition, uh, saying that the sources of ethics could be three, in fact, not two, uh, mainly the scriptural sources, as I said, and in fact, your uh, mind, your intellect, and there is something which is in the Sufi tradition very important, is the source of morality could be your heart. Because you have uh, verses in the Quran saying that even your heart understands, it's not only your mind. And for the people who are neglecting God, it is said, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They have hearts, they don't understand with their heart, because your heart understands. And it is said that in the way you deal with nature when you believe in God, this is producing a way to respect. The relationship is between you and nature, <coughs> you and your fellow uh, human being, and having God in between. The fact that, it, uh, that there is this belief that is changing your heart in the way you look at things is making you producing a kind of morality and good behavior. And this is why the first that were producing ethics in the Islamic tradition in a so structured way were not the, the, the legal uh, jurist or, or the jurist or the legal scholars. They were not the fuqaha, they were the mystics. And uh, tasawwuf, which in the mystic tradition, producing something which has to do with al-akhlaq, which is the ethical and was understood as the good behavior. And the good behavior is in the way you deal with the world and yourself, with your heart and your mind, you will produce and you have to understand that the only way you educate your heart, meaning you make your heart understanding more, in, is in the way you behave. So in fact, ethics is the way you educate your heart and when you have an educated heart is the way it's going to have an influence on your behavior. So you have three sources of ethics three sources. And by saying this, you understand here that there is a very deep concept of human being here. It's the concept of being human being is not only as you have in the uh, Greek tradition or the Christian tradition, this is something, and even in the Christian tradition, in the deep mystical Jewish uh, tradition and mystical Christian tradition, you find exactly the same, <laughs> is that it's a, a comprehensive approach of human being by saying, be careful, it's not only the soul and the body, there is something which is the soul and the body, and when they are together, there is something which is called the heart. The heart is not something which is in between, is when you join the two together and you understand that this is also producing something which has to do with morality, something which has to do with ethics, something which has to do with the good behavior. So this is something that we have in our tradition, the philosophical tradition, the mystical tradition, and the legal tradition. So all the, together, this is the way we deal with ethics, and it's very uh, uh, important to see that behind this you have a comprehensive understanding of human beings. You can't go only with your mind. You can't go only with your heart. And you can't go only with your instincts and your nature. The relationship between the three is giving you a concept of human being with it, which is at the same time interrelated, interdependent, and at the same time uh, the very understanding of what it means to be dignified. Dignified 
means in the Islamic tradition to be just with yourself. And to be just with yourself is to give to every dimension of your being what is necessary to put it at peace. Your mind, your heart and your body. So this is the starting point of anything which has to do with ethics. Do you follow uh, so far? It's okay? Not too complex. Second step now, which is also important, in the legal tradition, when the, the scholars were asking themselves about, okay, you might have this understanding of human being, and it's also important to say, okay, when I start being ethical and moral, who am I? Am I a human being who is free, who is innocent, or who is guilty? My being, the nature, the essence of my being, how do we qualify this? And you know that this is a very deep discussion. You know, many people, they think that what is the greatest difference between Christianity and Islam has to do with Trinity. This is simplistic. It might be that uh, the original sin is deeper in consequence than the understanding of Trinity. Trinity because, of course, in Tawheed this is something which is critical and crucial. But I'm talking here about the consequence in our daily life of what it means to think about innocence. And remember some of the, the poets and some of the uh, uh, writers and the novelists, and, and, and we have this in many, many uh, uh, way of dealing with literature, something which was very deep in the difference between the Greek tradition and the Christian tradition has to do with the sense of guilt. The sense of guilt. Are you innocent first? And if you are innocent, how do you deal with your freedom? Because the way you are qualifying human being and the way you are going to deal with freedom has to do with, am I dealing with my freedom as an innocent being or as someone who is guilty? Am I dealing with my, 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 uh, my freedom as someone who is jailed in his or her suffering? Or how am I, how am I going to define freedom? Because if I am jailed in my suffering, my definition of freedom is to get rid of suffering. So the way you qualify being is going to the way to be you deal with freedom. And, and this is a very important question. Today now you are, uh, apparently, you are free citizens. Apparently. Apparently you are free beings. Apparently. What I'm saying here is quite deep. How would you define your jails? With S. Where and what is a specific jail? In the whole process is the way you define human being. Tell me about your jails and I would know how you define human being. And how do you define the very essence of your freedom here? Because when you know what is preventing you from, I will know what is defining your freedom to be who you want to be. So this also has to do with ethics. Why? Because ethics is all about freedom. No freedom, no morality, no responsibility, if I'm not free. Which is why Kant and Rousseau, Kant the German philosopher, Rousseau the French one, were saying, we would never be able to deal with freedom if we don't deal with the limits of freedom. And limits is what? Ethics. In fact, the way you are going to deal with ethics is going to be the way you deal with freedom, and the way you talk about freedom is going to find the way you deal with ethics. I hope you understand what I mean here. It's a, a, a central philosophical question here that we have to deal with. The jurists were dealing with all this and at the same time they say, okay, that's fine with all the philosophy and the backdrop and the background of all our discussion. Now we have scriptural sources. How do we deal with this? When, for example, you have in the scriptural sources, you say, okay, you have to do that. This is a duty. Okay, you have to pray, you have to fast, and you know Islam is based on, built on five pillars. The first one is to acknowledge that there is one God and that you are following the last messenger for the Muslims, and then you have four practical pillars. So why should I do that? So how do you deal with something which is coming from on high 
and it's going to frame how to define your morality. Very important question why, because this is exactly where you are putting your freedom. How do I behave with God and with my fellow human beings when between me and God and me and you, there is a book telling me you should do this? So the scholars were saying in the legal system saying what we have to do is to come back to the rules and to try to find the raison d'être, el illa, it's why, why there is this. And they will say four to five to even sometimes to eight reasons. One is a very simple one, it's just you go to the text and you try to understand why do you have to pray. And sometimes in the verses, in the Quran, in the Revelation, it is said you have to pray in order to remember God. So we have the Allah, we know that we pray to do this. So the raison d'être of praying is to remember Him. Why do you have to fast? You can get that. Why do you have to pay uh, uh, the social purifying tax, zakat? Because, you know, you have many reasons. One is, is just to be close to God, is to be close to the poor people. The more you are uh, close to the poor people, the more you are close to God, you have references and you have things. So, some of the scholars were saying everything in Islam should get its Allah, which is the raison d'être. So, we need to know why we do things. Everything should be rational. So, we can find every, in everything that we do, the morality, the ethical framework should be rationally explained. You should know why you do and you don't do things. And sometimes you don't. And in fact, coming from some scholars, I say, you know the reason why you don't know the reason is the reason. Understand in spiritual term what I'm saying. So for example, it is said you have to pray five times a day. Why five? You go to pilgrimage, you have to Turn around seven times. Why seven? You start reading the Quran, you have sometimes letters with no, it's a alif, lam, mim, it doesn't mean anything, it's just letters. Why? So there is no raison d'être. Not at least on the rational way you deal with them. So we, I don't get the rationale, the rational behind them. And we would say, in fact, the reason of not having reasons for this is the reason why you believe. Meaning that sometimes you are not going to get the reason and this is where your reason should acknowledge its limits. So, I don't know. And you say, I believe in God, in this, not knowing the reasons for this. But this is where I surrender. I don't know why five, I don't know why seven, I just got it from my text because I believe in what is written. So, by not having a reason, there is a reason. So, it's rational. It's not irrational, it's a rationality acknowledging its own limits, which is rationality. Which is what Blaise Pascal was saying, by saying, if I don't, but you know this. You know this in your private life? Just let and try to explain to someone why you love somebody. And that's it. You rationally would say, I don't know why, but that's it. And this is the limitation of your reason. So, as uh, Blaise Pascal was saying, the reasons of love are sometimes not reasonable or not rationally uh, 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 reachable. We, don't, we cannot get this. So, this is the point of what was done from an Islamic perspective to understand from where we come, and this is one of the paths. And you have a Christian and in the Christian past many different ways, in the Jewish one, in the Hindu, in the Buddhist, but all these paths are going to the top. And where do we find things that we have to, uh, uh, to, to deal, uh, 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 or at least to have, to start a discussion? The first one when it comes to ethics, what is important, as I said, is to start at the center of our respective traditions and say, okay, at the top, to get the shared ethical values, what is your concept of human being? What is your concept or your understanding of people who don't believe in what you believe? So, what your universal message is saying about the messages of the other? Which is important. Because if you, you believe that your message is the truth, and you have the truth, and you may, and truth belongs you know, belongs to you, that could be very problematic. 
In fact, what is important is to understand that you might think you belong to the truth, but you should avoid thinking that truth belongs to you, which is not the same. One is an arrogant way to speak about God, and the other is a humble way to speak about oneself, about me, understanding that this is my path, this is what I am trying to get. So the starting point of this discussion about the shared universal value has to do with humility. Has to do with the way we deal with truth, with universal or universality, and humility is to look at the mountain, as I said, from the valley, never from the summit. And this is the humble way. I'm always talking about two qualifications when it comes to rationality, is to be, or the way we deal with our intellect, is to be, uh, uh, to get this uh, intellectual humility, which is what I'm talking about now, and also, and you can understand the difference, the intellectual modesty. The intellectual humility is, I believe that this is the truth, but at the same time I understand that in my dialogue and discussion and encounter with others, I can learn a lot about different paths. So I get a better understanding of the mountain and the different paths. Uh, so humility is the way I deal with the truths of others. Intellectual modesty is the way I deal with my own truths. It is the way I avoid thinking that I got it and the way I deal with others. So the two are important and they are not the same. What, the way I deal with my way of dealing with truth and the way I deal with the truth of the other. Humility and uh, um, uh, modesty in intellectual terms are important. This is the starting point of what should be afterward all the dimension of humility and modesty in our life. Now, all this is good and the world now is pushing us to come to the true discussion. The true discussions from the philosophical background, this is important. And I think that any one of us living in a pluralistic society like Britain, who is not trying from where she is or he is, to be at the center of his own <coughs> system of values. You may be an atheist, you may be an agnostic, you may be a Jew, a Christian, a Muslim, or a Hindu and a Buddhist. Whatever is your background and your belief at one point is from where are you talking to others and who you are, because at the end there is something which is very important in pluralistic society. You know what, at the end, I'm not going to be at peace with you if you are not at peace with yourself. That's the reality of it. The reality of it is if you are not at peace with your own system of value, you are not going to be at peace with me. So the peace between us depends on the peace with your own self. The more you are ignorant about yourself, the more I'm going to be a threat for who you are. That's the reality of it. So it's very much based, ethics has to do with responsibility is the way you deal with your own self. The more you are confident at at least trying to find a way, it doesn't mean that you are getting all the answers, but at least you are trying. When you know that you are on your way towards something which is giving you answers to your own questions, but if you avoid getting answers to your own questions, my answers are going to threaten your own questions not your answers, your questions. This is why very often the people are, when I'm talking about pluralistic society, I say, don't only ask me about my answers. It could be interesting for you to know about my questions. Because you can see from where I am questioning the whole system and the whole discussion uh, about our values. I hope you understand what I mean now. And by saying this, the last point that I wanted to make in this discussion about our shared universal uh, uh, values and the ethical one is why now it's necessary for two reasons. The first one is the world the way it is. We live in a world of uh, what we call globalization and it's true now that we are all, uh, all our societies, it could be in, the, in Africa, in Asia, in the, the, the global south, but also in the west, that we are living in, in more global uh, uh, pluralistic society within and a global understanding of the world where everything that is happening in the world is coming back to us. 
So we are threatening our identity. So all this discussion and all this controversy about identity and talking about identity, who are you, who are you first, uh, 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 all these things, are, are, do you belong to us, this sense of belonging, all this business about identity is very much revealing something which is deep. And because of this, we need to come to something which is, okay, let us talk about not only the legal framework, but also the values that we are sharing. Because at the end, it's based on this, it's based on our understanding of uh, what is our respective concept of human being, what do we think about freedom, what do we think about human dignity, and on this we build something which is also our ethical uh, value uh, uh, system and, uh, 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 and, and in which way we can deal with others. So the world is doing this and there is something where we are all in danger. Look at what is happening now in the world, the, 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 the trends that we can see. You know, one and a half months ago in the United States, there were a report, uh, a, a study on, on the type of mindset internet and the social networks are producing in the way we deal with Facebooks and things like this. And there is something with internet which is completely new, which is you can write whatever you want, but your name is not going, it's anonymous. So you can say, and nobody is, knowing, is going to know what you, I think. And then there is this international network connection everywhere. And this is producing two things. The first one is you as a subject, now you can write without feeling that you are responsible of what you write because nobody is seeing you writing. So your name is Tarek and for a while your name is going to be John. I can change my name and say whatever I want. The sense of not being responsible, add to this the sense that there is a global network is nurturing a sense of this uh, conspiracy things that everything is possible because the connection. So two things are now, and they can see in the mindset, even a sense of being de-responsibilized. I'm no longer responsible. I might be something which is the victim, so I can hide behind uh, uh, being anonymous, and then there is this global network, so our perception of ourselves in communication is completely changing on internet today, and it's producing a kind of a culture of being anonymous, and at the same time less responsible. So all this has to do with the global world and our means of communication. So we have more means and less substance. Not only more means and less substance, more means and less subject that are communicating between themselves. So this is a culture which is a danger because upstream for all, from all this, what we have is something which is everywhere when you sp speak about identity and you want to define your identity, you put yourself in a situation where you are on the defensive. So you are the potential victims of threats around. It could be the other, it could be the migrant, it could be the global world, it could be the economic crisis. So I'm less the subject and the citizen who is a subject, but much more the victims of the potential threat. So this mindset is something where when it comes to ethics, ethics is exactly the opposite. Anything which has to do with ethics is take responsibility, be a subject. You have to decide. Your freedom, your responsibility, and you have to decide. It's not the nur nurturing this, I'm anonymous, nobody knows, and then I'm the victim of the threats. And in pluralistic society, the populist approach is always dealing with this. You know, the four features of uh, populism are quite easy. The first one is this binary vision, is us versus them. The second is simplistic responses to complex questions, is unemployment, it's them, the migrant, the people, the foreigners. It's very old, but now it's with the new means, it's very powerful. Nurturing a me victim mentality among the citizens is our problems, is them. And then you nurture, and it works. It works. The third uh, dimension of populism has to do with, uh, has to do with uh, 
so the first one is binary, the second one is simplistic. The, the third one is the victim mentality. As I said, the victim mentality, we are under siege and we have to be cautious. And the fourth one is emotional, is all based on emotion. So is what I call emotional politics. When you look at our societies now, we understand that it's very, very important to come with uh, ethics, common and universal and shared ethics that we are promoting to become what? To start again being a uh, subject, responsible, dealing with our freedom and taking decision. You can sit down and see the governments, the global world not doing and then being the victim and being a passive. So the global culture could be a culture of passive citizens, only obsessed with their rights, not very aware of their responsibilities. So this is where we have to come together. This is resisting the consumerist society and resisting the victim mentality, because once again it has to do with responsibility. Add to this, and I will just uh, 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 highlight some of the challenges that we are facing all together because this is why we need this uh, 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 shared uh, uh, ethical uh, uh, background and share uh, universal values here is that if you look at the world now we all know that uh, the global warming for example environment we can we are all now facing this. So the way we deal with our means, scientific means and technology, now, not for the first time, but for the first time at that level, we are able to destroy the world. And we are doing it. This is what is happening now. So the world and nature and the environment, as we call it, and it's, this is a very Eurocentric way of dealing with nature, to think we are the center and this is the environment. I'm not sure that's right but this is the way we put it. So the environment is sending us a message. If you carry on the way of life you have, you are not only destroying nature, but you are destroying yourself. And first, of course, the rich people are letting the poor pe people being first destroyed and being killed. Because what we have, the tsunamis and things like this, of course, there is Japan, but mainly all the natural catastrophes so far are not coming to us. They are much more in Asia, much more in Africa. So it's still the rich that are destroying and the poor that are paying uh, uh, for that, for the way we deal with it. So this is where we need an ethical framework. What, and the ethical framework, it's important on many ways. So we talk about environment. We talk also about uh, uh, medical sciences now when we have power and uh, uh, the means just to change our uh, nature as human beings and what all the experimentations that we have are very problematic in ethical terms and we know this by and through the technology. Add to this many things that are questionable and we have to ask ourselves in which way we need to have ethics in the field that I was mentioning about education. At the end of the day this is something which is quite interesting for a university. You are all here, you are trying to get your degree or your masters and your PhD to be what exactly? to get a title, to get a salary, or to be citizens to change this society for the better. What at the end is the objective of your study? Which is ethics in education. It's also something that we have to ask because you can, you can get your degree by repeating what the professors are saying. That's good. Is this to be a student? The student is to repeat to get the degree or to understand to change the world. And you might take more time to get your degree are you, are you ready to pay the price? Not sure. So what is your take in the whole process of being students or, being, or trying to be involved within academia? What is the objective? And this is the last point that I wanted to raise here. All this has to do with the objectives in every field. And this is where we need to have a very deep discussion. And we are coming from different paths, but we have common and shared uh, ethical values, but we need to talk about all this and then to ask what is our objective with education? The kind of education, uh, educational systems that we have in our industrialized society in ethical terms, we have to ask ourselves what are the objectives. So at the end, 
Ethics is questioning the goals, the ends, what we call in philosophical terms finality, is what do we want to achieve by this. In education, something which is important, in uh, food, for example, you know uh, 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 the proverb saying, you are what you eat. But if you think about it, it's very worrying, because if you know what you eat, you might not be so good in what you are. The way we treat animals, the way we treat nature, the way we eat, what we eat, and the way, for example, some of the things that we are uh, drinking are just simply problematic in ethical terms. When you see, for example, once again, you have some transnational corporation giving you not only something to drink, but behind it, it's a way of life. Drink this and you are free. In, in, in the social term. This drinks and and it's very important for us to say, okay, I am what I drink or what I eat. And you see, for example, in the industrial, you know, have a problem with Muslims very often. They think about, uh, oh, how do we slaughter the animals to make it halal? It's, it's you know, uh, uh, licit. The point that sometimes you have to tell them, you know what, before asking you what is licit and, and, and not licit, it might be better to, to eat less meat. Just think about it. Not ask if it's good, this meat is good, but maybe you have to eat less. It might be ethical to eat less meat in the way you deal with the whole business and the whole dimension. Now about arts, something which is important, we just have this uh, meeting now, it's the very deep understanding of uh, 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 ethics and art. I don't buy anything which has to do with qualifying you know, all the things. I don't think that there is something that we can call Islamic education, Islamic economy, Islamic uh, uh, food, Islamic uh, medicine. I don't think that this is right. I think that we have Islamic ethics in every field, but not something that we can qualify. And it changed everything in the mindset you approach all these fields. But I would say that this is where with Christians, with Jews, with uh, Buddhists, with Hindus, with agnostic, with uh, atheists, with people of conscience, we have to sit together and say, what are our goals? What do we want to achieve? I would say that in our society, something which is the starting point of ethics of citizenship. Ethics of citizenship is start with your responsibility before just being obsessed and claiming your rights. Because with your responsibility, you change the world, and with your rights, you just protect yourself. And the world does not need people protecting themselves, but people who are ready to change it for the better. Thank you.